Welcome to See You at USC. I'm your Friday night host, Mackie Kravitz, and tonight we have concert violinist Elizabeth Pitcairn in the studio. It's going to be a great episode, so be sure to stay tuned. Welcome back to See You at USC. I'm joined by Elizabeth Pitcairn. Thank you so much for being here. It's great to be here. And you are a concert violinist. So tell me what drew you to music when you were young. I was drawn to music immediately because my mother is a Juilliard trained cellist. Wow. So she was playing and teaching when I was just in the womb, <laughs> hearing everything. And when I was three years old, I asked for a violin. And then I was practicing and training and dreaming of being on the big stages of the world. Which you kind of did. It's all <laughs> coming true, thanks <laughs> to my great education. And you went to USC, I believe, for undergrad, yes? I did. I moved out to Los Angeles when I was 17 years old. Wow. I, um, I wanted, of course, USC has a very famous music school, the Thornton School of Music. There was a particular violin teacher named Robert Lipset who was teaching here at the time, and I wanted to study with him above all else. And, <laughs> and moving to Southern California wasn't so bad from cold, snowy Pennsylvania. Wow. So. That's pretty far to go for a college education, especially in music. It was adventurous. It was also very good to get out from uh, uh, my parents' close supervision all mm -hmm. my life. And I immediately enjoyed coming from kind of the the back country of, of Pencil, rural Pennsylvania to um, being in this metropolis with thousands of other students I could meet and my first football game, which was <laughs> Labor Day at USC. Wow. Yeah. So. <laughs> Go Trojans. Go Trojans. So you said that your mother was a concert um, or a musician. Was your mm -hmm. father also? Was it kind of embedded in your family? It, very much so. So my father is uh, not a professionally trained musician, but he's a music lover and he's <laughs> a patron of the arts. He comes from a very philanthropic Philadelphia family that supported mm -hmm. the Opera Company of Philadelphia and the Philadelphia Orchestra. So he also is uh, innately musically talented. He's mm -hmm. an audiophile. He has something called perfect pitch, which oh. is an inherited trait, which yes. uh, I inherited from him. So, and I always liked it when he would drive me to my concerts and competitions because he was a calming influence. <laughs> um, so he is, he recorded all of my mother's concerts for her professional chamber series that mm -hmm. she started and has run for the last 45 years. He recorded them all and just was there to kind of make sure that I was practicing um, when she wasn't home. But he was um, very, very musically uh, gifted and inclined and always supported me and encouraged me. So my very uh, most recent recording I made, I dedicated it to him. He's oh. he's turning 85 soon. Wow. Well, happy early birthday, I guess. <laughs> so, did you have any other musical idols growing up? Um, well, some who aren't living anymore, but uh, David Oistrakh was a major influence on me. And when I got a little older, it was Yasha Heifetz, who used to live in Los Angeles, and believe it or not, taught at USC. Oh, wow. Um, really incredible. Um, they were big influences, and then there were others um, just growing up as a, a child that I really loved, Anna Sophie Mooder, and I got to hear Joshua Bell play when I was just 14 years old at the Meadow wow. Mount School, things like that. Um, and then, of course, my peers, and I, I was fortunate enough to be in the same studio as Sarah Chang when she made her debut at age six with our orchestra in Philadelphia. Age six? So I was 12. She was six. It's it was incredible. adorable. <laughs> she played just as great as she does now. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and I saw that you did get your start pretty young too. Do you want to tell us more about that? My start, yeah, I started on a violin that was a fraction of this size. I mean, it was so teeny, probably <laughs> like this big, this big, and you know, just squeaking away. But um, I, w I was very, um, I had an aptitude for music. My brother also played the cello, uh, but clearly he was more drawn to airplanes. So oh. it was just very obvious that my <laughs> Passion was was music, and um, he developed great skills on the cello, but ultimately um, became an aeronautical engineer. Still impressive. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I loved to perform, um, even from being a small child. Although I would get very nervous 
Yeah. Uh, and the adrenaline, mm -hmm. which um, you just have to embrace that if you're going to do something. Roll with the stage fright. Exactly. <laughs> Roll with it. Learn to embrace it. Learn to um, actually use it to your benefit. Mm -hmm. You know, when you get that kind of, sometimes I'll feel nervous days in advance. And I just think, bring it on, bring it on. How, what do you do to cope with that? Do you have any strategies or tri or like tips on how to deal with stage fright and stuff like oh, that? Oh well, um, one thing that helps is just massive preparation, because mm. then you c you c feel confident in your own mind, and that um, trying it out in front of people before you go and do it many many times, mm -hmm. so that you know, no matter how nervous you are, you know that that you have it solidly down. I mean, the worst feeling is to be terrified and um, not sure that you're going to make it through through the piece. So that um, that was something that my professor Lipset at USC mm -hmm. really helped me with. I didn't have quite enough um, practice performance under my belt growing up, so I had a developed some severe anxiety about being on stage. Mm. And he helped me. I also used to do 10 minutes of long, slow bows. I, I mean, moving like a fraction for the whole bow would take me a minute and a half, two minutes to hmm. go through. And after doing 10 minutes of that a day for several months, I went into a performance and hi at his studio in uh -huh. Randall Hall at USC in front of all the colleagues where it's the most nerve wracking. Yeah. And I remembered all of a sudden I was holding a long bow and all of a sudden I remembered, oh my God, my bow's gonna shake. It's gonna jitter like it always does, start bouncing uncontrollably. Hmm. And um, I'm thinking this in my mind, but my arm was like a rock. It was just so steady because of all that muscular control, discipline, bowing that yeah. I did. And that broke, it broke like the vicious. The, the nerves, the tension that gets expressed through movement, I guess. Mm -hmm. it's something that you don't really think about when playing the violin, or at least watching people vi play the violin. Yeah, no, I think all athletes deal with that <laughs> kind of thing. And um, when I would get nervous days in advance, I would definitely go into a, a state where I would let the nerves just wash all over me because if you if you if you can do that then by the time you get to the main performance your adrenaline has been worked out of your mm -hmm. system mm -hmm. but it's it's not fun it feels no awful it's not fun but it's good that you can come up with ways to cope and manage it and use it to your benefit it's, it's true very yeah. important as a performer yes your <laughs> mind learns to go into that place yeah when the lights go on you, s you turn it on, you go for it. You do. <laughs> you go into a special zone a focus. Yes. And when I was about 30, I started to leave my self. Huh. Like, I wasn't present. I, wasn't, I stopped being aware of my surroundings while being out playing with orchestra. And some of my performances, the piece will be 30 minutes long, and it's all from memory. So I really can go on this whole journey, because at that point I know it so well that it's, I could do it in my sleep, and I'm, I cease to be aware of my audience. Hmm. And the nerves are gone, and I'm a conduit for the music. And huh. That started happening right around 30 years old. I remember, because people would remark on it, they would call it and they would say, you know, you're, where, where did you go? You're just, you're just gone when you're playing. And then, then they go with me. It's like it, you kind of take them on a journey through your music. Yeah, I like way. that. So in what's the, the difference between a solo performance and like playing with a big orchestra or something like that. The difference is in playing for you. Well, we all train the same way, mm -hmm. and we all expect the same standards of perfection, basically. But um, when you're playing a solo, the audience can, most of the time, hear every note that you're playing. Mm -hmm. So it's quite a rush. You yeah. know? It is, um, it's a life of constant pressure. Um, you're only really as good as your last performance, and mm -hmm. we're, we listen with highly critical ears to every little nuance of what's coming out of the instrument. Mm -hmm. yeah. So did you perform in orchestras growing up and then kind of decide to go solo once you gained some momentum with your career? Or yes. tell me about that. Yes, I always was in an orchestra. I, I think my first orchestra was 12. And n even before that at summer camp, probably 10 years old, 10 years old. Um, but I always tended to work up to the first chair, which is called the concert master. Yes. And with the concert mat, so you seem to know. Quite I, a bit do about you that. know all throughout, <laughs> like, animation? I remember there's a Simpsons episode where, like, Lisa gets, like, first chair of the sax, and that's how I remember it. It's always, like, first chair is the best. Exactly. <laughs> and I, I think my friend uh, wrote that episode. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, really? So, yeah, it's one of the Simpsons writers. Um, <laughs> so, yes, it's, you know, you work that up. And when I got to USC, I started not last chair, but second to last chair. <laughs> and, you know, it's wow. kind of. Uh, there were many, many upperclassmen ahead of me, mm -hmm. um, and 
I walked in there thinking that I was kind of disappointed that I was yeah. all the way in the back, you know, because it was brand new. And You're a performer, you want well, to be seen. Well, I quickly <laughs> found out that that was a good thing because they all knew exactly what they were doing. And it was a mm -hmm. very hard piece. And the conductor started going down the musicians one by one, having them play. So fortunately, he stopped doing that before he got to the very back <laughs> of the orchestra. <laughs> and I remember dying and I went home and I learned my part so thoroughly out of sheer terror. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was great, great training. But <laughs> ultimately, I did become the first chair of the USC Symphony and many others. And um, out of being first chair, you get solo opportunities. Mm. And it's a very interesting position. You, you're kind of the ambassador as well to the public and to the musicians. And so I did that for many years. I was a concert master of a professional orchestra here in Los Angeles, the New West Symphony. Wow. And uh, soloing and teaching at USC for mm -hmm. 10 years. So I had this kind of 11 year period of doing that. So you were a graduate of USC and then you came back to teach. Yes. So what drew you back to USC? Again, it was this great professor, Robert Lipset. Um, and so I became a part-time uh, adjunct faculty member at, at USC, um, which was perfect because I only had like six students and I could balance my wow. solo career with teaching. Um, and I was working alongside of him and some of the students I would teach every week and he would teach for a month and I would get them ready to go full time to him maybe after two years. Mm -hmm. And those students who are SC grads have gone on. One is now a full professor at Michigan wow. University. Wow. Yeah. And, sh and she's in her early 30s, just 10 Incredible. years older than I am. So I guess we produce some, some good people, some good talent. <laughs> yeah. I mean, SC has always been one of the top music schools got a great reputation. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So tell me more about your experiences after SC. You were teaching and you were also performing like first chair and things like that. Do you have a favorite experience that you had? Oh, well, playing at Walt Disney Concert Hall Landmark. was huge. And then playing at Carnegie Hall mm -hmm. was, was big. So you've been bi-coastal. Yes. I, my parents still live in Pennsylvania. So I basically am either in Los Angeles or New York City and then other places in between. Going to <laughs> Europe more and more. So my oh. bucket list, I'll be in Vienna in the spring of 17, which is high on my bucket list because <laughs> my favorite composers, Brahms and Beethoven and mm -hmm. Mozart. And, and there's so Schubert. much history back there. Exactly. Yeah. It's the Mecca for us. So I'll be going there. Um, it was very exciting to start playing internationally. I mean, to not just to go to a country as a tourist, mm -hmm. but to go there and actually perform for a foreign nation like Finland, Sweden, to make, I commissioned a concerto by a Swedish composer and recorded. Mm -hmm. So I went there twice to make the world premiere in 2005 and then back four years later to make a recording for a Swedish record label. And these wow. are things that are, you know, just really, it was cool. I like that feeling and I've always wanted to see everywhere in the world and, you know, get to meet people and also influence music and children. Do the thing that you love, that you're passionate about. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> well, stay right here. We're gonna be. We're gonna take a quick commercial break, and we'll be back with, um, and we will hear more of your music. And stay tuned. Hello, this is Stewie Griffin, and you're watching Trojan Vision. You're watching the Lion Center voted the number one squash courts on campus. Brought to you by Trojan Vision.
back to see you at USC. We are joined by solo violinist Elizabeth Pinkerrett, and she is going to do a piece by Vivaldi's Four Seasons entitled Summer. keep talking about your violin experience and actually I wanted to talk about the violin itself because I know that you have a family history heritage with a, a very special red violin and if you could tell us more about that. Yes. Well this is a, a violin that was gifted to me when I was 16 years old from my grandfather, a Philadelphia based family. Although I had started violin when I was three but when I was 16 the famous red violin came up at auction in London, mm -hmm. I was taught it was um, hadn't been on the market in 45 years. Had lots of original red varnish on it. It was in the possession of relatives of Felix Mendelssohn, <coughs> the famous <coughs> composer, and it was played by Lily von Mendelssohn, the daughter of the family, in the 20s, the 1920s, in Berlin, Germany. They were a wealthy banking family with four Stradivarius, a complete string quartet, wow. of which this came out. So it was incredibly rare. No one had really seen it. And I'm very fortunate that I had a Juilliard-trained cellist mother who knew about <laughs> instruments, made special permission arrangements with the auction house, with Christie's, for me to see the violin literally for 20 minutes. We flew from Pennsylvania to London. Wow. I missed a day of high school. Played on the <laughs> instrument for 20 minutes. Our, this the secret bidder for our family was in the room that day. Uh, we pretended not to know him. He was there scoping out other bids, sealed mm -hmm. bids and things. There were a lot of people. So we went home, and then the auction took place on Thanksgiving Day of 1990, a day I will never forget. <laughs> we were waiting for the phone to ring. And finally, oh my God. in the evening, got the call. He had barely gotten the instrument. It was the very last bid he was allowed to make by our family, and he went running out of Christie's, chased by international press, all yelling, what country are you from? So he made up a country, kept running, and nobody knew where this instrument went. And then I didn't have it my freshman year at USC. Hmm. Um, it was loaned to a musician in the Philadelphia Orchestra for a year because my mom just didn't think that the freshman dorm was a great place for the, the Stradivarius. <laughs> Seriously, that is some high kept stuff you need to keep locked down. That's an incredible story. Wow. Um, so what's the difference between playing on this violin and just any other old violin? Do you feel a connection? Is it a different sound? It is. Uh, Strad is a very identifiable sound, mm -hmm. and um, people have done blind tests on me, and I am somehow able to, to pick out uh, Stradivarius from, from other instruments. Uh, having just attended a Formula One race in Austin, Texas, <laughs> um, I always compare um, having a great instrument, like having an F1 car, as opposed to trying to drive like a Yugo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's it's you know it's the car plus the driver, mm -hmm. right? And the same thing with the instrument. So these instruments by Stradivari, who by the way was an incredible inventor and made over 1,100 instruments in his lifetime. Wow constantly experimenting with the shape and size and design of the mm -hmm. violin and really going for um, power and beauty of tone. Well, he accomplished that. So the, the best place to really hear what a Strad can do is in the big concert hall like Carnegie or Walt Disney mm -hmm. Hall where it carries to the last person in sure. the last row. 
Do you think it's the way that they were made in the 1700s that it was just stronger material or? Definitely. Uh, if you look at this instrument, the arching is not very high. Um, some of the earlier instruments, maybe Amati, or would have a very high arching. And it, it produces a uh, sweet but smaller tone. Hmm. So he kind of flattened it out. He also settled on the perfect dimension. Not yeah. too big, not too small, perfect for a player. The wood he used, phenomenal maple. You can see the, the grain of the maple. It's beautiful. Um, and it's cut on a quarter, on a slab. It's so perfect. There are no imperfections in this grain. And even Stradivarius, after the year 1720, when this was made, could not get that kind of wood. And then this an great piece of spruce here. You can see where someone, before they used chin rest, the person put their chin right on the wood and played. Wow. Hundred, this is a, a repair that's um, hundreds of years old, but it shows up in the Mendelssohn family photograph with Lily holding this. You can see it on my website, redviolin.com. Mm -hmm. So you can see a picture of Lily Holding the same oh violin. Yeah, in 1920, right before she was killed in a car accident, which wow. is tragic. And when you think of like the story of the red violin film and how you know, that violin is haunted by the soul of a woman, I always think of Lily and how her soul might be Yeah, honest. yeah, yeah. Was that film inspired by this violin? Is that so it's based on history we know nothing about huh. and um, pretty much the auction where things leave off. That we had no at. idea. Yeah, we had no wow. idea. It was many years after that um, that I played the uh, soundtrack from the film in a in the Southern California premiere in the year 2000. Um, it's a great piece of music, and we had just no idea there was any kind of coincidence. So it was the film critics and um, that uh, and the music critics that wrote the story and, and, and said, said there was this coincidence. So the red violin, uh, the red Mendelssohn, it was named the red Mendelssohn by Joseph Joachim. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've been following the trail of the mm -hmm. violin. I met uh, relatives, descendants of the Mendelssohn family who mm -hmm. told me that, um, that their father had purchased it, I mean their, their ancestral father had purchased it from uh, Joachim. And then uh, I came across a, an article about Joachim having lent it to a Czech violinist for his North American tour in 1880. Wow. So now we know at least where it was, but still there's like 200 years so of, much history of missing. Of unknown history, but also yeah. known history. And now it's embedded in your family and it's been there for a numerous amount of years. Yes, yeah, so, so I've had it since 1990, so 26 years. On the 20th anniversary of the auction, I played a concert in Cremona, Italy, where this instrument was made wow. for the Italian people. Who knows when the last time this instrument was in Cremona could have been yeah. eons ago, but it was my first time. And it was so incredible. I can't tell you what it was like to go to really this, the birthplace of the home of Stradivari. That experience must be. And the violin liked it. It liked the temperature, the climate, the, the wood. You felt it right away. Can the violin speak to you in a sort of the way? Violin speaks. You know, the wood, the, the moisture, the humidity, the temperature all affects the wood. When I go huh. from Colorado to Ohio and the different temperature, it all affects the wood. And it just, I felt like the violin was happy when I got back to Cremona. It was singing. <laughs> it was. <laughs> I love that. And I know we talked earlier about some of the experiences you've had, and you do run a summer camp or a summer program, oh. if you would explain that a little bit more to our viewers. Yes, so this is a program in upstate New York in the Adirondacks. Um, I inherited this program. It was originally founded by a cellist and his wife uh, from the Philadelphia Orchestra. Hmm. So when I was 14 years old, I attended the program. It's called the Luzerne Music Center, Lake Luzerne, New York, a small mm -hmm. lake. But it's, it's very close to Saratoga Springs and Lake George, about an hour north of Albany. So we accept. Um, students from all over the world. We had, um, including the USA, we had 12 different countries. Wow. Um, so 20% of our students were international. Huh. We raised scholarships for students from the US and internationally to attend the camp all year long. And uh, so in between my concert engagements, I'm out performing charity benefits for, for Luzerne Music Center and a variety mm -hmm. of other causes. Mm -hmm. I love to do that. Um, and our students are ages 9 to 18, and they play mm -hmm all kinds of instruments, not just not just stringed instruments. Okay. Um, they play flute and oboe, trumpet, wow. French horn, trombone, percussion, piano. You got a whole orchestra there. Yes, and <laughs> it's a it's a fun summer camp too. So then they get recreation. They come out of the camp really much better citizens and they have professional training. They have 
social training and they they're meeting each other and mm -hmm. and I can tell you from my own experience that I'm working professionally with a lot of the students that I met back in 1988 wow they've started their own festivals they hire me I hire them it's your network so these kids from the ages of 9 to 18 are literally cre creating their their future really? connections and contacts yeah, yeah, which I USC is so renowned for anyway. The Trojan Mafia is real, <laughs> as you can see. <laughs> and I do have one more question for our viewers that are interested in music and the arts. What word of advice would you give them? Viewers who are um, interested in music as music, a... Music, arts, just pursuing that as a career. Oh, as a career. Yes. Oh, um, yeah, find your niche. Um, be very well-rounded is the advice my professor Lipset gave me. Don't narrow yourself out of a career and go with what's working for you. Hmm. you know? And also don't quit when, when the going gets tough. You know, power through it because all those times that you practice and you try when other people are too tired and you don't feel like it, that puts you ahead of everyone else. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here and gracing us with your music and oh, your violin. It was pleasure. so lovely to meet you. You too. And be sure to watch See You at USC every weekday at 6.30 here on Trojan Vision. Happy Halloween. You're watching Trojan Vision. For more of your favorite shows, check us out at trojanvision.com and like us on Facebook.